Hey everybody, good morning. Glad to be here. Uh, yes, I did get a haircut. <laughs> it's it's not the angle of my screen. Finally got a good haircut. Thank God, I can still that do that in Florida. Pretty much, you can do whatever the hell you want in Florida. Okay, another good line from the play Hamilton. Uh, in that uh, says, "Hey, it's in New Jersey. Everything's legal in New Jersey. In Florida, right now, there are no rules. Um, you know, uh, still COVID is uh, being taken very interestingly here in the state in which I live. All right, everybody, glad to have you here. Grab a coffee. Um, let us know you're at, and we'll get started here in just a second. Because believe it or not, this is the 59th episode. 59 of these things." Been doing this since the first of April, everybody, and still going strong. So, welcome to the 59th episode of FinTech Insider, the Breakfast Show US. I'm Sam Mall, 11 of us managing director in North America. I'll be your host for the morning show. Please let us know where you're watching from. Uh, the global audience component of this is so much fun. I uh, love seeing who we have on. Uh, again, we've had folks from Manila, Saudi Arabia, Spain, UK, uh, Nigeria, Lagos, South Africa. You take your pick. Um, India yesterday. So this is a lot of fun. Let us know you're at. We will make sure we give you a shout out. Make sure you share the link to this stream. So if you look down, you're going to see that little share link. Click on that. Let your network know that you're watching this. Hit the like buttons and please subscribe to 11FS on LinkedIn so you never miss a show. Same with our podcast, FinTech Insider. Any of your streaming services, you can go out there anywhere where you listen to podcasts, you can find FinTech Insider Great, great podcast. I think we're up to 400 and, I don't know, God, 80, 90 episodes over there. If you haven't read our latest research report yet, we published one with Plaid about how open finance will shape the industry. Go to the link that Bianca will throw out here in the comments section, or you can go to bit.ly forward slash open finance 2020. All right. So first off, as we do every day, three news stories from the past 24 hours that caught my attention. They should have yours. The first one is from CNN, the ongoing saga at Wirecard. Seems to be a story every day here. So Wildcard now has filed for insolvency just days after a $2 billion accounting scandal at the company burst into the open, crashing a stock and leading to the arrest of its former chief executive. The digital payments company said in a statement Thursday it had opened legal proceedings in Munich due to impending insolvency and over indebtedness. Shares in the company, which have lost 90% of their value in less than a week, plunged sharply in Frankfurt after the announcement was made. Marcus Braun, the Austrian tech CEO who built Wirecard into one of Germany's biggest companies, was arrested earlier this week on suspicion of having artificially inflated the company's balance sheet and sales through fake transactions. Prosecutors said that Braun may have acted in cooperation with other perpetrators. Wirecard acknowledged on Monday that 1.9 billion euros, which equates to about 2.8 one billion in cash, U.S. dollars, was included in their financial statements, or roughly a quarter of its assets, good Lord, probably never existed in the first place. The company withdrew its preliminary results for 2019, the first quarter of 2020, as profit forecast for 2020. Essentially, this is the fintech version of Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, everybody. And it's a shocking, shocking story. I'm waiting for the movie to come out again. If a CEO of a tech company starts wearing black turtlenecks and tries to look like Steve Jobs, run away. That's some advice from your Uncle Sam. All right, our next story, TechCrunch. They report AWS today announced the beta launch of Amazon Honeycode, a new fully managed low-code slash no-code development tool that aims to make it easy for anybody in a company to build their own applications. All of this, of course, is backed by a database in AWS or Amazon Web Services and a web-based drag and drop interface builder. Developers can build applications for up to 20 users for free. After that, they pay for user and for the storage their applications take up. Customers have told us that the need for custom applications far outstrips the capacity of developers to create them, said AWS VP Larry Augustine in the announcement. Now with Amazon Honeycode, almost anybody can create powerful custom mobile and web applications without the need to write code. Like some of our tools, Honeycode provides users with a set of templates for common use cases, like to-do list applications, customer trackers, surveys, schedules, and inventory management. Traditionally, AWS argues a lot of businesses have relied upon shared spreadsheets to do those things. So let me repeat that last statement. <laughs> Traditionally, AWS argues a lot of businesses have relied on shared spreadsheet to do those things. Hell yes, a lot of companies still depend upon Microsoft Excel. Oh my God. Uh, when people say they're a FinTech people, dig just a little bit deeper. If there's a spreadsheet in there somewhere, start shaking your head. And finally, New York Times reports 1.5 million workers 
filed for new claims for state unemployment insurance last week, the Labor Department reported Thursday, the 14th week in a row that the figure has topped 1 million. An additional 728,000 filed for benefits from pandemic unemployment assistance, a federally funded emergency program aimed at covering the self-employed, independent contractors, and other workers who don't qualify for traditional unemployment insurance. Total number of people collecting state unemployment insurance in the U.S. is now 19.5 million, down from nearly 25 million in early May. Latest data comes amid conflicting signals of the U.S. economy. Um, we'll see, right? Uh, multiple states have reopened, and now multiple states are seeing tremendous increases in COVID cases. I believe Texas topped 7,000 here in Florida. We like to top 4,000 massive outbreaks in Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Arizona. And as a signal of that, Apple has shut down stores in Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Arizona, and seven stores in Houston. All right. And one last story real quick uh, that just broke before I came on. Um, I talked about this last week about how Facebook was launching a WhatsApp payment service in Brazil, and Brazil has shut it down. Lasted exactly 10 days. Uh, in this statement, the Brazilian central bank said it was taking the decision to preserve an adequate competitive environment, ensure functioning of a payment system that's interchangeable, fast, secure, transparent, open, and cheap. If there's one thing Facebook has not done well in so far, <laughs> I know David Marcus over there has got to be pulling his hair out. So anyways, let's move on. Um, let's introduce our guest for today. We're going to have a good conversation, folks. Today, we're excited to be joined by Kareem Derhali. He is the CEO of Investor. Today, we're going to take a look at how Investor is fueling financial literacy through gamification of investments. Kareem, how are you? Uh, I'm extremely well. Delighted to be on your show. Thanks so much for, for having me. Unlike you, I haven't had a been able to have a haircut in about three months. And uh, my wife loves it. My mother hates it. As I said uh, to a friend recently, I, I live with my my wife, not my mother. So I guess she she gets to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, trust me, my wife my wife wins any discussion that we have. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm assuming you're in London. Uh, I'm actually in the countryside. We we wow. managed to get out of London um, right before the lockdown, so we didn't break any laws. We we came out to the countryside, and we've been enjoying. I'm looking out the window. We've been enjoying just fantastic weather for the last three months. We've been. I mean, that's you know. If there's a silver lining, I mean, that's been it. I mean, the weather's just been unusually kind to us here. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about um, your company in just a minute. But I, before sure. we do that, I'd love to kind of set the stage a little bit because yeah. you're, you're, you're the type of fintech founder I love because you've had <laughs> an incredibly long career in banking. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Deutsche Bank, uh, yes. Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, right? Yes, and Bankers Trust. Yep. So there you go, folks. Here's somebody who's been around. They know what they're talking about. This isn't theory. So you founded Investor back in 2012, right? Correct, yeah. All right, so why don't you tell us what's the mission statement? What's the ethos of Investor? What is it you focus on? So at Investor, you know, we're all about financial education. Uh, we're about financial, we're a financial education and investment app, and we've managed to build a community of several hundred thousand people all over the world who are passionate about learning, learning how to invest. Uh, we have three values, which are diversity, collaboration, and individual empowerment. But as a fintech, the thing that really sets, you know, we think sets us apart from other fintechs is that we have three uh, distinguishing beliefs. Firstly, we believe that we're all natural investors and that actually anyone can learn uh, to become an investor in the way that you learn to play a sport uh, or a musical instrument. The second thing is that we actually don't think that fintech is either about uh, finance or technology. We think it's about people. And so everything we do uh, as investor is focused on empowering people uh, to become great investors. Uh, and the third uh, thing that we believe is that investing isn't an event, it's a journey. And actually it's a journey that you don't need to take alone. It's a journey actually you should take with other people uh, along with you. So real quick, I got to give a, a shout out to Brian Cladgett, um, who just said in the comments, uh, Wirecard should be renamed Wire Fraud. That was clever, Brian, good for you. For those that are asking, that heard on the story yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. my oldest daughter tested positive for COVID yesterday. Good news is my son-in-law and my seven-year-old granddaughter test came back negative. So uh, mm -hmm. good silver lining in there. Um, so thanks everybody for asking. Um, this does feel like a little family event now, <laughs> every morning that we do this. Here's here's why I absolutely love your product, 
Great. And I'm not the only one, by the way. You guys, you were named Entrepreneur of the Year at the GoTech Awards back in 2019. Uh, the, the, you know, obviously the product is fantastic. Here's what I like about this. I made this statement yesterday in a podcast. It's one thing to make an app. And we talk about democratizing um, uh, financial services, right? So it's one thing to create an application. It's another to then also educate at the same time. And especially in the investing space. Um, I mean, we've, I've given this story a couple of times, folks. Everyone knows about, at this point, what happened with Robin Hood, the young college student who actually committed suicide. Um, uh, a lot of it due to the fact that he thought he had lost something like $738,000, um, basically just not understanding what he was doing. Yep. That's why I love your app, this, this concept of you can also educate. So can you talk about that component and, and how you do that? Sure. I mean, look, firstly, what happened to, I think his name was Alexander Kins. I mean, it, it's truly tragic. I mean, it's tragic for him. It's tragic for his family. And what's even more tragic, it, it should never have happened. Uh, you know, I think fintechs as companies, we have a responsibility. We have a moral yeah. responsibility to help people learn. Beyond that, we've got a legal and regulatory responsibility. And, you know, every, every company, I don't want to single out any particular uh, company, but all of us have a responsibility, I think, to address the needs of our users and to do what's suitable for them. And the regulators uh, have a responsibility on top of that to ensure that we're actually behaving that way. So it's tragic that it happened. And it, frankly, it should never have been allowed to happen. And he shouldn't have been in, put in that position. If he was, he shouldn't have been ever put in that position to get over his skis to the point that he took his life. I and mean, it's, it's, it's truly tragic. So look, we think that, uh, you know, I mentioned it, for us, it's all about people. And, and we think that the biggest need that people have has never been that commissions are too high. I mean, that's in a way, that's a rich man's problem or, or an active trader's problem. I'm paying too much in brokerage commissions. You know, we've surveyed several thousand people, different age groups across the US. And overwhelmingly, you know, the answers that came back were nothing to do with the cost of trading. It was all to do with lack of confidence, lack of knowledge, and perceived, you know, the, the perception that you needed to have uh, a lot of money to become an investor. And so that's what we've majored in uh, at Investor is about providing people with the financial education that they really need to become skilled, competent, confident uh, investors. And we so, do that in, yeah, sorry. Uh, and I was just going to ask you as you talk about that, because we had a great question come in from Veronica Truist saying, do you have programs that are focused on a younger audience to start them early? So I'm gonna be selfish, Karine, because I know you do. Right. Um, I have an 18 year old daughter about to go off to college. The lack of education from a from a government standpoint, right? From a school yeah. standpoint around investing is shocking. It is absolutely yeah. shocking here in the US. So the good answer, Veronica is yes, and he's about to dive in, how? <laughs> I think, you know, I think out of the, there are 17 states, I believe in the US that um, legislate that financial education should be part yeah. of the program. The problem I suspect though is even in those 17 states, the way that financial education is delivered is probably suboptimal. It's probably a teacher going in 45 minute class talking about yeah. concepts that people don't really understand. And it's probably unfortunately instantly forgettable the minute that the students leave, leave the classroom. So what we've tried to do is to build a financial education program that is uh, durable, that is memorable, that is highly engaging. And we do that in, and, and also familiar where, the, where the, the learning curve is super, super low. So we, we do that in three ways. The, the first way is we have a game because people love to play games and we all learn naturally by playing games. So we have a game called Fantasy Finance, which, kinds of, uh, which kind of gets you in the middle of the game, the, the, the bigger game, the real game, the financial market game. And you get to experience all the thrills and spills, particularly you know, the volatility of the markets over the last uh, few months. You get to experience all the thrills and spills of the markets um, without risking any real money. Uh, and in the process, and we can talk about it more in detail, but in the process, you, you start to learn some of the basics about good portfolio management yeah. without even realizing that you're actually doing it. The second thing that we have on Investor is we have, we built an entire social network. Um, you know, so I used to joke that if Michael Bloomberg and Mark Zuckerberg had had a love child, it would have been Investor. <laughs> and, uh, and so we built an entire social network with social profiles, a feed, uh, group chat rooms, direct messaging. 
all to enable people to learn from each other. Because I think particularly younger generations, they don't want to listen to ex so-called experts or, or yeah. people like me. They want to learn from each other. And what we do is we enable collaboration and communication and peer-to-peer -peer learning at every level, either community level, at a group level, and also at an individual level. And then, so learning by playing, learning from each other is, is fine, but people also want to learn a little bit in a more structured way. So last November, we rolled out something that's called Investor Academy. And Investor Academy is still fun, it's still social, you know, you get trophies and certificates, but it's 85 lessons split into 10 modules, structured step-by-step -step practical guide to everything that you need to learn to become an investor without the jargon, some theory and some very strong practical advice as well. We've had 45,000 students go through that. Um, you know, we, uh, we've had you know, thousands of people graduate. Uh, we get rave reviews. We've written it in a way, answering your, your age question, we tried to write it in a way that a 10-year-old could understand. I mean, that's kind of been our benchmark. Um, so it's bite-sized. If you don't want to read it, you can also listen to it. So we have, we have our own, you know, we've uh, created an audio version of every single one of those 85 lessons. So we made it super accessible and, and it gets rave reviews. And I, I don't think there's another syllabus quite like it. I mean, there's so many investing for dummies and kind of financial education, but there isn't a syllabus quite like it in the rest of, uh, in the, rest of the industry. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the concept of it. Um, and, and, and you go, you, you keep introducing new components um, and correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I think I remember reading, you actually have a crypto index. Correct. That's, that's so a good move. Yeah, no, we have, a, we have a crypto index, we have a dollar index. When people uh, first play the game, we give them a million dollars and a hundred trades. And the idea is to allocate that million dollars across, um, uh, across a portfolio. And we give people what are called jumpstart portfolios. So if they're not sure what to buy and sell, not to, what to put in their portfolio, what to buy in particular, then they have a choice of, uh, a choice of portfolios. Uh, one is brand swag, uh, one is tech crunch. Uh, sorry, um, a tech junkie. Uh, yeah. And person we've created all those portfolios and start with a jump start portfolio and then see how you're, how you're doing compared. If you start to change that portfolio to see how you're doing compared to the index, if you had, if you'd done nothing and just left the money alone. So are you adding, you know, what we would call alpha? Are you adding additional returns through active management? Yeah. Brian Claget, um, former of uh, Gizio, he's now an advisor investor at Blip, and he's probably at his lake house. Um, Brian, every time you post a pic on Twitter, I get more and more jealous. Uh, but good comment. He said, the social aspect is interesting. Building a community like that drives engagement, loyalty, and empowers the customers. Yes, and it's also damn hard, is it not? <laughs> it's it's extremely hard. I mean, we were talking yeah. uh, before the show about trolling and other, and other things. I mean, you've got to be very, very careful. Um, it's a huge yeah. responsibility, again, to manage that community and to keep it constructive. Um, and actually, one in three of investor team members are actively involved in the community day to day. Uh, I mean, for example, anyone anywhere in the world could, you know, pick up an uh, investor and send me a direct message and ask me a question. I mean, thank God they don't do that all at once, but we're very, very hands on in the community. And so we get, look, we get fantastic reviews about all the features in the app, whether it's the academy and also the, the game and people get addicted to, to fantasy finance. But we particularly get you know shout outs for the community and and it's the quality of the community and it's not you know we we help you know we instigate it we help manage it but at the end of the day it's the people in the community um, who are self policing they're creating many communities within it in in the group uh, leagues and the group chats that are created they're contributing to the feed they're driving the engagement and you know we're we're so thankful to all the investor members we have all over the world who, who are making that community a really positive, constructive place for people to learn about investing. And I'm really curious for your feedback, um, especially on the US. So, and what I mean by that is on the retirement um, side of this, because um, I, I began my career um, at Northern Trust back in the 90s, focused on 401k management and uh, what we call in the US DB and DC. So defined benefit yeah. or pension plans, which pretty much don't exist anymore. They're, pretty much gone in the US and it's been a big shift to employee slash employer contributions in the 401k. And I think what we're quickly realizing is, um, you know, for a, I'm gonna say a minority of folks that has worked out well, uh, there's a significant retirement gap that's 
<laughs> come, come forth in the US and COVID is exasperating that. Um, after the financial crash in 2008, we saw so many people's portfolios crash. And if you're in your 60s or 70s, you're never making that money back. And it, we're, we're here or there again now, right? So yeah. it's it's rather interesting. I love how Siddharthar, of course, Siddharthar said something. Hey, Siddharthar, saw this coming. Oh, a Professor Scott Galloway call out. There we go. Uh, recode call out. Uh, Professor Scott Galloway wrote, oh, dang it. He said something really brilliant in the comments. Moved. Here we go. He wrote a powerful piece called I addiction saying that tech and trading platforms are attracting primarily young day traders, many of whom are addicted to trading driven by its variable rewards and gamification. So how do you promote the opposite? So responsibility, deliberate and informed trading. And is there data to show you're succeeding in a growing retail investor competence? Man, good question, Sidera. Wow, excellent question. Look, I mean, I think there are two challenges. I think the first challenge is that you, is to get people in the game. And actually one of the first you know, lessons in Investor Academy, you know, we do the compounding that everyone else does and we show you that if you start investing early and you start investing on a regular basis, then with the power of compounding, you actually need to save less money over your lifetime than you otherwise would if you started age 20. Exactly. So you know, the, the, the first challenge is to get people in the game and making it fun and making it engaging helps to fulfill that challenge. I think it's an excellent question because the next challenge is then to help them once they're in the game is to teach them, help them learn the right ways of staying in the game. And what we, you know, the, the messages that we try to get across to people is that investing isn't about generating dollars and cents. It's not about generating profits. It's about generating a return on your capital consistently over time. So the fancy finance game, actually, we changed it uh, a couple of years ago. It's all about the way we judge people is about the return on capital, not their PL, uh, not their profit or their loss. It's about the return on capital. So the psychology of the game, it's all about what kind of a return am I generating? And can you do that consistently? And it's a you know, it's a one month period. We'd love to do it, do it longer. In fact, some people have said, you know, let's push out the boundaries of the game, but we need to keep people engaged at the same time. So we found that a one month kind of time horizon is the right, uh, is the right framework. We do people keep their portfolio, so we just um, you know, they can see that all time performance as well. Um, so it's about, and, and then what you realize it's about staying in the game. So how do you stay in the game? So you've got to stay, the staying in the game is through diversification, right? Because yeah. if, you, if you knew which way the market is going at all times, then you don't need to be diversified, right? If you could get short buy card at the right time, then God bless, you're doing, you're doing fantastically. Most of us don't have those supernatural abilities. So diversification is what keeps you in the game. And that's what helps to preserve your financial capital. And the, the other point that we make also in the academy when we're giving people practical tips at the end in the top tip section is it's also about preserving your emotional capital because financial markets are just amazing at exhausting people, at playing with their emotions and forcing them out because markets will only move when people are out, right? If everyone's in the same, you know, if everyone is long, market's not gonna be able to go up because there are too many people long. So preserving your emotional capital is about being efficient in how often you trade and only trading as often as you really need to. And again, it's a, it's a criticism that we've had is that we ration the number of trades that people get. Because again, we're trying to teach people, so you have to be diversified. You can't put more than, in the free version of the game, you can't put more than 10% of your portfolio in any one instrument. And then you get a limited number of, of trades, so you can't go trading you know, left and right uh, and so we're trying to teach people good long-term investment management at the same time, making it fun and exciting and engaging to get people involved. Oh, I got a great comment out here from Hashim Siad. And sorry, Hashim, I probably slaughtered your name. He's a growth marketing at Facebook. He said, it's a fantastic app, highly recommended for those who want to learn about financial markets and investing in a fun way. Congratulations to the team. So there you go. Good oh, praise. Wow coming from Facebook. So Hashim, I take back everything you said about Facebook launch <laughs> in Brazil. Um, we love so, Facebook. Yeah. so I, I'll give you, um, I, I always like admitting uh, my own mistakes. So back in the 90s when I went to work for Northern Trust, yeah. um, I had an ESOP program. So for those of you that are familiar, that is literally Northern Trust granted me stock. Um, I, I was given, it was part of my pension plan when I worked there. And uh, I saw multiple stock splits. Northern Trust still a great bank, by the way, everybody. But come 2002, there was a massive market crash that, you know, we talk about the dot com crash and after effects of 9-11. So I learned that stock options and and 
an ESOP program and everything, if you're not diversified, meaning I had way too much of my um, retirement tied in with my own company, yep. which by the way, all went away. <laughs> right, because, right. <laughs> yeah, when, you're granted, when you're granted stock at say $60 a share and it goes down to $30 a share and then you're given six months to exercise that stock, it yeah. doesn't matter how wealthy you are on paper. <laughs> I'm still in my daughter's bedroom, everybody. I am doing a live podcast and I am not retired. Um, so the concept of diversification across multiple assets is and dollar cost averaging, right, Kareem? I mean, that's what yes, I tell my kids absolutely. constantly. But I love the idea of a sandbox where you can learn and play. And I'd be curious to see. Um, I'm sure you've got to get questions around integration, maybe with some other apps. I would have called you and asked about that. Right. Yeah, I know that we've had we've had lots of people reach out to us because I think you know building a transactional platform is relatively straightforward. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, it's commodity plumbing. You know, there's some regulation regulatory hoops you've got to you've got to jump through. But building a social network, and you know, we're a small we're a small team, and every time you know we we have a request to our our chief technology officer, he says, look, I don't have eight thousand engineers who are managing <laughs> the, the the feed. You know, we we have twelve right. engineers uh, in the business, and so. Yeah, no, it's it's not easy. I mean, the things that we've done uh, in terms of building the feed, making it relevant, we built a whole artificial intelligence uh, technology so that we can deliver to solve a problem, which is delivering the most relevant content to our users at, at, at any point in time. It's actually a patented uh, profiling and recommendation technology. So we look, you know, we create dynamic profiles of every one of our users every six hours, and we match up the content so they're getting relevant information that's specific to them every six hours. So no, all of these things, the game, building a game, I and mean, we had so many full starts on the game until until it finally took off. I mean, these things, these things take time, but you know, we believe one, it's super important. I mean, this is the big social need out there. Um, you know, I, as I said, I think financial sustainability is as big a threat to our society as environmental sustainability is to the yes. planet with all the debt that we've accumulated. So it's super important, you know, from a moral point of view that we help people uh, people learn. But we also think from a commercial point of view, that's what people want. And we're going to, you know, by being seen to be so focused on helping people address this need, we think that's what's that's what drives engagement, loyalty uh, and long term commercial success as well. Well, I, I, I absolutely love the concept of the product. I love the success you've had. Where's the and believe it or not, the half hour is gone. Told you. this. Oh, wow. is <laughs> I know. That's what I said. You're like, seriously? amazing. Yeah. I've got like eight notifications of you're supposed to be on a call because <laughs> that's my life, everybody, as is everyone else's. Where's the best place for folks, one, to learn more uh, about Investor and two, if they want to get in contact with you? It's the best sure. place for them to contact you. So obviously, um, website, INVSTR.com, no E, no O. Um, uh, best advice, obviously, download the free app on uh, Google yeah. or Apple and play around, register, create an account, uh, join the game, join the community. Uh, if you want to get hold of me, LinkedIn is a great place to to reach out to me. I've got um, you know uh, quite a big following on on LinkedIn, so reach out. Uh, love to hear from you all. Love to hear from uh, people who want to learn about investing, people who want to partner with us, uh, help to to grow to grow the whole project. And and uh, folks, um, here's what's interesting. Our guest tomorrow is Lowell Putman. Lowell is from Plaid. He actually started a company called Quovo that Plaid acquired. And Lowell Putman's great great grandfather is the founder of Putnam Investments. I can't make this stuff up. It's just mm -hmm. <laughs> the synergy between today's shows and tomorrow's is excellent. So folks, join us tomorrow, man. Lowell One is just, uh, he's a lot of fun. He's really good. And I don't know if there's a hotter company in the US and globally than Plaid right now, outside of like Stripe and Square. So as always, everybody, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, if you have suggestions for folks that'd be great for the show, um, you can reach out to me at Sam Mall on Twitter, here on LinkedIn, or Sam at 11invest.com. Or if you don't want to go right to the producers, go to breakfast show at 11invest.com. Everybody, thanks for being here. Great questions today. Kareem, thanks for being here. Really enjoyed it. And we'll see oh, everybody tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye.